Oh, humans. Humans, humans. Hello? Hello? Are you there? Hello? Hello? Oh, you are there. Oh, I'm so glad you are, because guess what? At this very moment, we are going to go where no think tech show has ever gone before. We are going to go be below the equatorial belt line. We are going to go into a region which every human being can relate to. We are going to explore with my guest, Katie Rydell, the other F word. You may be asking yourself, the other F word? Not the one that comes to mind. There's the story that you tell about the things that you did, and then in the middle of it, slowly, don't say that you haven't, don't say that you don't, leaning over on one side, letting out that imperative pressure building within, letting it sneak, going back, resting back with that contented smile. That's right! Today on Think Tech Hawaii with Katie Rydell, we explore the folklore of the world's farts! Fart folklore with Katie Rydell. Let's have a hand for her. Please, out there, let's give her a hand. <laughs> <laughs> so, Katie, is it really true that you are a folklorist? It is really true. I have a master's degree from UCLA to prove it. Wow. And whatever started you in this unique slice or sliver or little speck? How did I get started? Yeah. I was working on my master's degree. I was doing a comparative study of the three little pigs. Hmm. We, we do very scholarly research <laughs> at UCLA. And I found a 19th century Italian version of the story in which the wolf farts houses down. <laughs> and I was so surprised. That puts so, a whole new meaning on the huff and the puff yes, and the does. blow it down. Yes, it does. Hmm. And um, I was amused and fascinated by this. Yes. So I did further researches, and one thing led to another, and umpty ump years later, I have a substantial anthology of stories about the other F word from all over the world. Farts! <laughs> I myself am so excited I'm almost ready to explode. <laughs> and I've heard her say that this is her life work, folks. So, you kids out there, come a little closer to the cameras. You who are uh, a little older might want to sit back and listen carefully. It might inspire something you've not thought about for quite a while. Have you got a story to share with us, Katie? I have. Or several? I have many. <laughs> Here's the first one. It's, sure. It's from Japan. Long ago, in a little cottage by the edge of the sea, there lived an older couple, a man and a woman. They made their living gathering seaweed from the rocks down on the shore. And one day they were down on the shore going about their work when they looked out in the bay and they saw something odd. They saw a boat bobbing on the water. Nothing odd about a boat bobbing on the water, but there was nobody in the boat that they could see. So they waited until the wind and tide pushed the boat in toward shore. Then they looked in the boat and there stretched out on the bottom was the body of a young woman. She was still breathing, still alive, but she had clearly been at sea for a long time. Her hair and her face and her kimono were encrusted with salt. Her skin was scorched and burnt and blistered from the sun, but she was alive. So the old couple helped her out of the boat. They took her back to their cottage. They nursed her back to health, and then they could see three things about this young woman. They could see from the fabric of her kimono that she came from wealth. They could see from her face that she was very beautiful. And they could see from her belly that she was pregnant. Well, she clearly had no place to go in the world. And the older couple had always wanted a child, so they welcomed this young woman into their home treated her as though she were their own daughter. Time passed, the young woman gave birth to a little boy, and then the older couple was just delighted. They had a grandchild. 
And the young woman was delighted too. She had a healthy baby, but there was always something sad and distant about her. The old couple asked no questions. They did not think it right to pry. But the boy grew up, and his friends in the village began to ask questions. Who's your father? What's your father's name? Where's your father? Don't you have a father? Who's your father? And the boy passed those questions on to his mother, but she didn't answer until she thought he was old enough to hear her story. And then she said, I lived in another village across the sea, and I was very beautiful. So when the Lord of the province chose a wife, he chose me, and I was very proud. I went to live in the castle with the Lord, and I was very happy, but the other women in the castle were jealous. They tormented me, and one day, one day they crept into our sleeping chamber and they lifted up our sleeping mattress and under the mattress they put seaweed, the kind of seaweed you see down on the rocks that has little air bubbles in it. They spread a layer of seaweed under the tatami and that night when my lord and I lay down on the sleeping mattress those little air bubbles popped open and made noises. <laughs> and my lord said I had dishonored his household. He said I had brought disgrace and shame on his ancestors. And he dragged me from the castle and cast me adrift in an open boat. And that is how I came to be here. And the boy thought about that story until he decided he was old enough to travel. He told his mother he was going to cross the sea and find his father, and she begged him not to go, but he was determined, so she gave him all she had to give him, and that was two gold coins that were so, had been sewn into her kimono. The boy took those two coins, he sailed across the sea until he came to the province where his father lived. Then he took those two gold coins and he laid them on a flat rock and with another sharp stone he smashed those coins to smithereens. He gathered up the pieces, put them into his hand and he began to walk up and down outside the castle gates crying out loud like a peddler. Seeds for sale! Seeds for sale, golden seeds for sale. Golden seeds grow golden fruit, all the golden fruit you care to have. And the Lord of the province heard those strange words and he sent his servants out to bring the boy into his presence. And the Lord said, tell me about those seeds. And the boy said, oh yes, golden seeds. All you have to do is plant them in ashes, water them with tea, and they will grow up into a tree so fine it will have leaves of silver and fruit of gold, pure gold. I must have those seeds, said the Lord. Oh, there's just one thing, said the boy, just one thing. These seeds must be planted by someone who has never farted. <laughs> And the Lord said, ha, there is no one who has never farted. And the boy said, then why did you treat my mother so harshly when you thought she had farted? And she hadn't. She was framed. It was the seaweed under the sleeping mattress. And with those words, the Lord realized how unkind and unjust he had been to his wife. And he realized that this boy was his son. He sent for his wife. She came back to live with him in the castle. And the three of them lived very well in a nice, happy, dysfunctional family. <laughs> the end.
<laughs> so if you've never farted, that's a story for you. And who among us would dare say you have never passed gas? If you haven't, you're dead. There you go. It's only those who never eat that never fart. It's a good thing to remember when you think about the common denominator that makes us all together. So uh, are there some uh, other things? I mean, that story must provoke a lot of comments from the many audiences that hear it. Yes, it has. I hear a lot of uh, personal reminiscences um, and a lot of uh, tidbits <laughs> that, as word has gotten around, that I collect fart lore people have sent me over the years. But right now I would like to tell another story. Well, hold that thought, okay. because now it's time for Think Tech to Hawaii to take a little break to ease the pressure within. We'll get back to you right away. I'm Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association. We do monthly luncheon programs with ThinkTech about things that matter to Hawaii entrepreneurs, investors, and business service providers. So join us on the fourth Thursday of every month at the Plaza Club. For information about upcoming events or to join our mailing list, visit hvca.org. See you there. Oh. <sighs> I'm much relieved for that break. And now I'm glad you're back with us because we're here with the specialist of folklore pertaining to the lower quadrant Farts. Katie Rydell, all the way from Maine, here in Honolulu, to be part of the just finished Fringe 3 Performance Art Festival, which raged through Honolulu. She did a couple of shows. People were beside themselves with tears, enjoying the guffaws and the cacophony of joy. And she just was saying during the break, she's not done yet. Aren't you glad? All right. All right. Let's go to France. Here's a story. Many, many versions of this story, but this particular one comes from the 19th century. It's the story of Jean l'imbécile, Jean the idiot. Jean was out cutting wood one day. He was cutting a branch off a tree. Unfortunately, he was sitting on the branch he was cutting, and he had the saw between him and the trunk of the tree. So he was sawing off his own perch. At that moment, a stranger walked by and looked up at what Jean was doing and said, Young man, you are about to have a great fall. And Jean the idiot said, oh, poof, 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 I know what I am doing. And he went on with his sawing. And two seconds later, he sawed through the branch and, poof, branch, and Jean went tumbling to the ground. And as Jean picked himself up, he began to realize, whoa, that man could predict that I was going to fall. Maybe he can predict when I'm going to die. And he went running after the stranger. He said, excuse me, monsieur, 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 can you tell me when I'm going to die? And the stranger looked at Jean and said, yes, I think you are going to die when your donkey has farted three times. <laughs> Whoa! That was an interesting bit of information. And Jean was very pleased to know that, but then he began to panic because his donkey ate grass all the time and his donkey got gas all the time and his donkey farted all the time. Jean was all of a sudden in a panic. He ran back to his house <laughs> and there was his donkey tied up on a grassy patch in front of the house and Jean was totally freaked out because right then at that very moment the donkey let one go. Oh, one down, two more to go. Jean was totally freaked out and his donkey let another one go and Jean was terrified. Oh my God, I'm almost dead, I'm almost dead. But then he saw a little piece of cork lying in the front yard and Jean got a brilliant idea. It was such a brilliant idea. He picked up the cork, he got a hammer and he hammered that cork into the donkey's backside. Oh, <laughs> safe. 
Now I can live forever. <laughs> However, once those gases reach one's lower intestine, there's only one place for them to go, and that's out. And the gas built up in the donkey and built up and built up and built up until finally the donkey was able to expel the cork. <laughs> <laughs> the cork went flying through the air, hit Jean with such velocity that it drilled a hole right through him from one side to the other and killed him dead. Thus, fulfilling the prophecy that he would die when his donkey had farted three <laughs> times. <laughs> I'm like a third grader. I've found my inner <laughs> child. This is like, like being, uh, did you ever go into the bathroom and the boys would tell silly, goofy things like this? Such a delight to be able to get somebody to tell these tales. Do people come up with them and, and share them with you quietly over the cross of life or folklore, reading uh, old volumes in uh, stuffy libraries or? I've learned to travel with a notebook. <laughs> <laughs> so as to seize the moment as yeah, it were? Yeah, people will come up with just delightful little gems. <laughs> and I collect all of it, family <laughs> proverbs, um, as well as stories and bumper stickers. You name it. Oh, for instance? <laughs> Bumper stickers? Yeah. Ah, uh, what if the whole world farted at once? <laughs> That's a good one. Um, there was a terrific one in, in back in the 70s, uh, I want to say 73, but I'm not sure. There was a big gas shortage. And people used to have long lines at filling stations. And there was a bumper sticker that said, save gas fart in a jar. That was good. But my all-time favorite is, um, if you get any closer, I'll fart. <laughs> How's Thanks that? for the warning. How's that for deterring people from driving <laughs> too close? Personal I'd, space. I'd back up. Yeah. <laughs> I'd back up further. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, really, who among us has not and does not, admit it or not, this is the staff of life. This is real stuff. As you were telling that last story about the the expelled cork that ended the life of the, the one trying to save his own, uh, yeah. I'm thinking like of, of peasants in a... Uh, you know, a manger with lots of hay and animals where this is quite common, trying to come up with stories to entertain themselves, their children, and the collection of people huddled around a fire trying to stay warm. Yeah. Folk. Sure. And the kind of tales that would make us, uh, in a way, the kind of anonymous geniuses that, that, that create this and, and the fun uh, yeah. that it, that it yeah. adds to life and the ad admission that, in fact, we all have these... Uh, we are all human, and mm -hmm. believe it or not, humans are animals. I know some people don't always believe that, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Case in point, another yeah. story. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I gave a performance in San Diego one time in which I told just one story on this topic. And a few weeks later, I got a little, actually a big envelope in the mail from a man named Bill Johnson who lived in Alpine, California. And he had a little granddaughter named Raya who had come to my concert. And they had both enjoyed that particular fart story very much. So to entertain his, his granddaughter uh, at Christmas, which was coming up, Bill Johnson had written this next story, uh, which I think is a little literary gem. <laughs> Yes. Once upon a time, in the little town of Alpine, there was a young girl named Raya. And Christmas was coming, and she was very excited that Christmas was coming, because her Christmas, Santa Claus presents, but also her family would be gathering, and she had a beloved grandmother who would be coming, and her beloved grandmother would be bringing Raya's favorite food, which was baked beans. 
No, Raya knew what these beans did her to her gastrointestinal <laughs> tract, but she loved them so much she always ate too many, and then there was a price to be paid afterwards. So, but she knew that. Whatever. Her grandmother came. She brought the baked beans. Raya ate too many. They were so delicious. How could she not? But then the uh, after effects began to set in, and her mother said, Raya, why don't you go for a walk? And Raya went outside, which was a good place for her to go, and began to walk down the street. Now, the neighbors and her friends all up and down the street knew what these beans did to Raya when she ate too many of them. And so they all knew what was happening as these, it sounded like a gun battle going on <laughs> out in the streets. First there were the sounds that Raya was making and then there were the sounds of everybody slamming their doors and windows to keep the, the sound and the smells out. And Raya was so upset when everybody was slamming all their windows, she went back to her house in tears. And her mother looked at her poor little daughter in tears and said, Oh, sweetie, come here. Raya said, Oh, Mom, don't, don't, don't. But it's too late. Her mother gave her a little hug to comfort her, and that pressure around her <laughs> body just caused an ex certain expulsion and because the mother was holding on to Raya the two of them shot up and <laughs> banged against the ceiling of the kitchen they both hurt their heads and uh, Raya's mother said maybe maybe you'd better just go to bed early so so Raya did she went upstairs to her room and tried to go to sleep but she was pretty unhappy and she was still making these sounds and emitting these odors and uh, late that night, she heard bells up on the roof. She thought, oh, Santa Claus. Um, sure enough, the reindeer and the sleigh and Santa settled down on the roof. Now, as it happened, Santa had a cold that year, so he didn't smell anything bad. But Santa's reindeer did not have colds. And they could smell these aromas coming up from Raya's house. and. Santa stepped out of the sleigh to deliver the packages and the smells just got to the reindeer and they couldn't handle it anymore. They just took off into the night sky, just off like a rocket. And Santa was up there yelling, Dasher, Dancer, come back here. And of course they didn't. Um, and Raya heard all this commotion and she knew what was going on. She uh, crept out onto the roof very carefully and she stood next to Santa and they could see the sleigh kind of disappearing into the distance and Santa was very upset. He was saying, ah, there goes Christmas for all the children in the town. It's ruined. I won't be able to deliver any packages. And Raya said, Santa, give me a hug. <laughs> he said, okay, sweetie. She said, no, I want a really hard hug. Grab me around the waist and squeeze tight. And he did, and she took off like a rocket and expelled the two of them <laughs> up into the night sky. They had no trouble at all catching up with the sleigh, which was traveling much slower than the force of Raya's farts. And they caught up with the sleigh. Santa got control of the reins and the reindeer. They went back to Raya's roof. <laughs> she got back to her home, and Santa was once again in charge of the reindeer and the sleigh and could deliver the packages and Christmas presents all over town. <laughs> Word of this event spread through the neighborhood, and the next day, Raya's friends came to visit, and they apologized for slamming their windows when Raya was walking down the street on the previous day, and they said, and uh, we brought you a little present, and they gave her a cork. <laughs> <laughs> The spirit of giving. Yes. Isn't that a touching Christmas tale? <sighs> you know, it's getting close to that time of year when all we storytellers are called upon to come and perform for special occasions and the gatherings of families and coming together. And I can see how this new one is going to find its place on yeah. the hearth of many yeah. <laughs> and will have a long life. I hope so. It's a <laughs> sweet little love gift. <laughs> Very touching story. Yeah.
We should all have grandpas who write stories like that. Well, we'll let us all contemplate that as you go and uh, perhaps relieve the pressure of joy that's been building May our, from our family to yours. May you indeed expel all exuberance and prepare yourself <laughs> for the next centers of stories when we come back. This is Think Tech Hawaii. Man, oh man, what kind of technology we have here today. <laughs> I'm Nicole Horry for ThinkTech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone No. 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Horry. Mahalo. Good evening. We're delighted that you've come to us today. We are here for Think Tech Hawaii. Important issues, important people, people who talk too much. It's all right. You haven't got anything else to do. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. Yes, this is ThinkTech, broadcasting on Ustream and Spreaker both day and night, doing its thing on OC16 and Olelo, and uploading videos all over YouTube. Check us out and see the links on thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo. Oh! Are you feeling lucky, boys and girls? Friends and neighbors, we are here as time quickly passes by, enjoying the nectar, the little nuggets, the tidbits of a folklore rich in flavor, scent, bouquet. <laughs> We're talking about Katie Rydell, Rydell here from Maine, who is sharing with us a lifetime of collecting tales about farts. That's right. You heard it right here on Think Tech Hawaii. Fart stories. <laughs> I am delighted. Let's take it away with another little gem, shall we? All righty. Let's go back to Japan and tell the story about a young man who lived in one village and a young woman who lived in another village. And the young man had a mother who thought he should marry, and he did. He chose the young woman who lived in the other village. So the wedding was about to take place. Everybody was all excited. Everybody was happy. The night before the wedding, the girl's mother took her aside and said, dear, you know about that little uh, thing that you do? Yes, mother. Well, just." When you move to your new home, try not to do that. <laughs> yes, mother. So the wedding took place, and the young woman went to live with her husband and his mother. And the mother-in-law was delighted with her son's bride. The girl was sweet-tempered. She had a sweet face, just sweet personality. Everything was good. Plus, she was a hard worker, and there was a lot of work to be done on the farm, and the girl was a willing participant. So life was good for a while. And then the girl began to look as though she were getting very sick. Very, very sick. And the mother-in-law was worried. She took the girl aside one day and she said, Dear, is, is something the matter? No! I, <laughs> you, don't, you don't look well. I, I think something is wrong. No! Nothing, nothing's wrong! Are you sure? I, I, look, you look sick. Something is wrong. I, I wish you would just tell me. I will help you. I will help you. Please, just share what's wrong. Well, I have to fart. And the mother-in-law 
rolled her eyes and said, oh, for heaven's sake, just go ahead and do it. No, no, you, you don't understand. Of course I understand. We are all human. Look, we live on a farm. Look at what the animals are doing. Just go ahead and do it. Okay, but I think you'd better grab hold of something. Can you just grab hold of that post holding up the roof? Just grab hold of it. Oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> but the, the mother-in-law was willing to humor the daughter-in-law, and so she grabbed hold of the post, and the girl finally let it go. <laughs> She'd been saving up for a while, and the gas that had accumulated was under high pressure. <laughs> when it finally came out, it was like having a typhoon in the house. <laughs> there is no way anybody on the planet could have held on to anything. The mother-in-law went sailing out through the door, loopity loop through the air, came down poof, in the middle of a turnip field. She picked herself up, went to find her son. She said, you've got to take her home. You've got to get the girl out of her. She's a health hazard. She is dangerous. <laughs> we cannot afford to have her in our household. Take her back, take her back, take her back. And the young man was very sad. He liked his wife, but when he heard the story, he could see how it could be dangerous to keep her around. So they packed up her things, and he began to escort her back to her home village. But it was a long way. And on their journey, they passed through a village. <laughs> a typhoon had recently passed through, not the one generated by <laughs> the young woman, but a storm typhoon. And it had knocked over the centerpiece of the village, the village pride and joy. This just a beauty thing was this great big tree that had just gone <laughs> fallen flat over. The tree was fine. And the roots were all intact, but the roots were sticking up in the air. And the people wanted to have their beautiful tree back in the middle of the village. So they had rigged up ropes and pulleys and were trying to haul this enormous tree back into place. And they weren't having a lot of luck because it was a very, very large tree. The young woman gave a little giggle. <laughs> I could help you put that tree back. The people said, really? You could? Yes, just step away from the tree. And the people stepped away and gave her a little room and she took aim and went and popped the tree right back into place. The villagers were so grateful. They took up a collection and rewarded the girl with this little pouch of gold. That was pretty nice. But the young man and young woman continued on their journey and they came to a river and there was a spit of sand sticking out into the river water and there was a barge stuck on the sandbar and the barge was all covered with these big bales of hay, uh, sorry not hay, rice, this is Japan. And, um, so the barge itself was heavy and the bales of rice were heavy and the bargemen were having no luck with their poles getting the barge off the sandbar. And the girl gave a little giggle and said, I could get that barge loose for you. And the bargeman said, really? How could you do that? She said, just give me a little space here. So they did and she went <laughs> and the barge popped loose and the bargemen were just so grateful and they decided that effort like that deserved a reward so they gave her three bales of rice and the young man looked at his wife and he said well it's nice to have three bales of rice but what are we supposed to do with them how how can we carry them she said no problem I'll send them back to your farm and she kind of turned around and took aim and went <laughs> And the bales of rice just went sailing <laughs> off above the trees, presumably back to the farm. And the two of them continued on their journey, and they came to a pear tree. It was a magnificent pear tree. It was huge. Its fruit was ripe, and just the smells just <laughs> was so sweet-smelling. 
anybody near that tree would want to eat the pears, but nobody could get the pears off the tree. There were these um, men standing around and they had long poles, but they couldn't reach the branches to whack the pears loose and nobody could climb the trunk. It was too big and there was no foothold or handhold. They were very frustrated and the woman gave a little giggle and said, I could get those pears down for you. Really? <laughs> yes just stand away from the tree and they did and she took aim and with one blow poof, all the pears came tumbling down <laughs> to the ground and the people were so grateful they took up a collection and they gave the young woman another pouch of gold and at this point the young man looked at his wife whom he liked very much and he looked at the two two pouches of gold she'd collected and he thought about those three bales of rice and he said come on honey we're going home and they went back to the farm his mother saw them coming and she came running out in a panic waving her arms no no go back go away go away don't bring her anywhere in here no no take her back the young man said no mom i'm keeping her this young woman is a real asset to our family. <laughs> and he held up the two sacks of gold, and sure enough, there, right in front of the barn, were three big bales of rice. Look, look what she's brought to this family already. The rice, the gold. Besides, I like her, she's a real gas. I'm keeping her. <laughs> and he did. He built a little hut for her out behind the main house, where she could go when she needed to let loose. So everyone was safe, and they all lived very happily ever after. Yeah. <laughs> so let's take this as the concluding thought, boys and girls. Women sometimes need their space. And sometimes somebody full of hot air can be quite an asset, even though they need to be given room to express themselves in the way that they find most comfortable. Well now, Katie, I know that you've got a whole bag full of little surprises for us. Is anything else percolating up into that little mind of yours? There's always Throckmorton. Throckmorton. Please do tell. As a scientist, Throckmorton knew that if he ever farted in an echo chamber, he'd never hear the end of it. <laughs> That's a sample of the little tidbits people have sent me over the years. It's just amazing. Hmm. Encore. <laughs> <laughs> you are insatiable, I am, I think. too. <laughs> oh. From Japan comes the lovely haiku poet Isa, who wrote this sweet little gem. Awakened by a horse's fart, I saw a firefly. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? I heard that for the first time in a lecture given by Pete Seeger. <laughs> so I'm not the only one apparently attracted by this material. There you go. I'm all ears. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the number of times farts turn up in the news. You wouldn't you wouldn't think it would turn up in the news, but it does. Um, it's a recent story from Leicester, England. Cops in a car, and one of them with a gastrointestinal problem, <laughs> which he was easing himself out of hmm. in the car with the windows all rolled up, and his companions inside the cop car were just dying from the smells, so they rolled their windows down, and uh, they were taking deep gulps of air to refresh themselves and is because they had rolled their windows down at that particular spot in that particular time and they were taking deep gulps of air that they smelled a lot of marijuana uh -huh. and they had apparently stopped right outside a little factory and it led to a little bust yeah uh -huh. so Farts can be crime stoppers. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never know. You never know. Wow.
So I have alert friends all over the country who send me these little tidbits. It's great. I love it. Well, well since, uh, like farts, our time is quickly fleeting, and soon our time together will be just a memory and a residue in the air lingering <laughs> in our memories. Is there anything, a little story that you might want to uh, throw in just to make everybody sit up straight? Oh, I don't care if people are sitting up straight or not. <laughs> Well, then you bending can, over you, or slinking off. You can flop on the couch as far as I'm concerned. Make yourselves comfortable. Um, okay, the very first fart story I ever heard. Mm -hmm. This comes from a book called Brief Lives. It was written by John Aubrey, who was the first serious English biographer. And his book is was written in the 17th century and it's full of little tidbits including this little tidbit probably apocryphal but it's so juicy um, it that he wrote about Edward de Vere Edward de Vere was the 17th Earl of Oxford he lived in the 16th century at the time of Queen Elizabeth the first and so he was part of her court. And one day, in making his low obeisance before the queen, he let pass a fart which resounded around the room. <laughs> so abashed and ashamed was Sir Edward that he left the court and traveled abroad for seven years wow. until at last he summoned the courage to go back to court. The Queen had always been fond of Sir Edward, so she greeted him warmly. She said, Sir Edward, we are so glad you have come back. We have quite forgot the fart. <laughs> uh -huh. Amazing. Uh-huh. It can be memorable. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. More. Yeah, yeah, more. Okay. A follow-up, perhaps? Or the ancestor of that one. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> the imagination reels. The ancestor of that story about Sir Edward de Vere is one that turns up in the tales of the Thousand and One Arabian Nights. Mm. The story of Abu Hassan, who got married. He had a big wedding feast. All the guests were sitting in this sumptuous chamber. Feasting away, the bride was in her chamber getting ready for her new husband to join her. Abu Hassan rose to leave his company and join his bride, but as he rose in front of his guests, he farted. <laughs> everybody heard it, and he knew everybody heard it. He was so embarrassed that instead of joining his bride, he went out to the stables and saddled his horse and rode away into the night. <laughs> he stayed away for 10 years until at last he became so homesick that he went back to his home village. He slunk into town under cover of darkness, hoping everybody had forgotten what had happened. And he was creeping past one house where there was an open window. Inside the house, there was a mother combing her daughter's hair. And the daughter said, Mama, how old am I? And the mother said, Let's see. I'm not sure, but I know you were born in the year that Abu Hassan farted. <laughs> and when Abu Hassan heard that, he just turned around and left home and never went back. So sad. Oh. So sad. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> May none of you have a story to add to that in your own personal living. Well, uh, if there's a l another precursor or follow-up tale, uh, we've just got a sliver of a moment to squeak out another tale. Are we talking, how long a sliver of a moment are we talking about? Oh, four-ish minutes-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-ish-
I know you told me a tale once upon a time. In fact, we were in Casanova's and you called me up to the stage saying, I'm a little frightened to be in front of this rowdy group. I'd like you to help me with the physicality. Oh my God, okay. I've forgotten about that one. Oh yes. That is a gem. Some of the best gems come from Japan. <laughs> Can you whistle? You know how to whistle, don't you? You just put your lips together and blow. Sure you do. A farmer went out to the fields one day, a poor peasant man, and he was working in the fields when he heard a bird singing. The song was astonishing. It was so beautiful. His jaw dropped open in astonishment. And while his mouth was wide open, the bird flew in. <coughs> he had a bird inside him and he first he tried to spit it out again. And that did not work. So he was kind of trying to help the bird work its way down through his digestive tract and hoping to expel it at the other end. And it reached the other end. He knew because the feet were sticking out. <laughs> but the whole bird wouldn't come out. He, he pulled on the feet. And every time he pulled on the feet, he'd hurt. Hear that beautiful song again. Went to the beautiful song part. <laughs> it's a bit muffled by the, uh, okay. <laughs> the tones within. Okay. He got home and he told his wife what had happened. And she kind of bent down to look and she pulled on the feet and she heard the beautiful music but she also smelled this sweet aroma. She said, husband, that's exquisite. The song, the smells, that's wonderful. And all the neighbors came in to smell it and to hear the music. Word traveled fast. The Lord of the Province heard about this phenomenon and he sent for the farmer to come to the castle. And the farmer went to the castle and the Lord asked him to show him this sweet aroma and the beautiful song. <laughs> and the Lord said, just, you know, pull on the feet. And the Lord pulled on the feet and the song and the smell came out. And the Lord was so thrilled, he rewarded the man with a sack of gold. <laughs> the man went home. He and his <laughs> wife were sitting there counting their gold. Clink, 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 when the neighbors came by. And they, of course, wanted to know where all that gold came from. And the man told his neighbor. The neighbor went home, told his wife. She said, okay, sweet potatoes for dinner. <laughs> He said, honey, you don't want to serve me sweet potatoes. You know what happens when I have sweet potatoes. She said, yes, I know what happens when you have sweet potatoes. Even without sweet potatoes, you're the <laughs> biggest farter in all Japan. But now it's time to get something good out of your farting. Eat the sweet potatoes and then go see the lord of the province. So she fed the sweet potatoes to her husband. And yeah, they made him fart a lot. And he went <laughs> off to the castle and the guards didn't want to let him in but he persuaded him them I'm the finest farter in all Japan and you know <laughs> the lord of the province is fond of farting so they let him in and the man gave a demonstration of farting in front of the lord of the province but the sound was not particularly sweet and neither was the aroma so instead of going <laughs> home with a sack of gold he went back with a couple of bruises on his body. So, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure what the moral of that story is. Maybe <laughs> don't try and fart like your neighbor does, something like that. <laughs> a happy ending indeed. And that those who have a pure heart and may swallow their pride <laughs> may come away with it with a bag full of gold. And those who are indeed selfish may indeed spoil the air of sharing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> there you have it. That's the high-tech note that we bring you from Farts and Katie Rydell all the way from Maine, sharing folk tales for all of you at home. Now, Think Tech Hawaii does a lot of wonderful things, and one of them is they put all of their sessions on a website. Look on YouTube and look for Think Tech Hawaii, Katie Rydell, 
the other F word because I know everybody in your elementary school class will <laughs> want to go over it over and over and over again. Let's say thanks, Think Tech Hawaii. Thanks, Katie Rydell, with her voluminous vocabulary <laughs> and collection of farts. <laughs> you heard it right here, folks. Let's have a hand for Katie Rydell. Maybe that's entertainment, don't you think? <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs>